Why has Russia done so badly in its invasion of Ukraine? And what explains Ukraine's successful defense against its aggressive larger neighbor? And will its current counteroffensive be effective? If you've read or watched the news at all in the last year, you've probably heard a dozen different takes on how and why things have gone the way they have. Explanations for the war's current state range from Russian incompetence to Western military and logistical support to Ukrainian grit and superior strategy. The reality is that all of these factors and many more have led to this stage in the war and will determine how the conflict may change in the next year. There is also another explanation, once recently pointed out by Telegraph associate editor and British Army veteran Tom Nichols, which can also tell us a lot about the war's future. It involves a way of looking at conflicts which is nicely summed up by an old military adage. Armies don't fight wars. Nations fight wars. Armies just do the shooting. Let's go over what Nichols means by this phrase, its significance for Ukraine and Russia's strategies, and what it tells us about how modern wars are really won today, both on and off the battlefield. First, in order to really understand the chances of Ukraine or Russia's strategies leading to success, we need to consider the conflict in terms of national will, not just battlefield activity. The collective will of a nation to reach certain military, economic, political and societal objectives is critical. It can determine whether a country can coordinate and deploy resources against an enemy. In the West, there was a lack of political and economic will to nation-build in Afghanistan and Iraq, and as a result, military superiority alone couldn't achieve the desired outcomes. Russia is now dealing with its own, far more severe crisis of national will, something made worse by Putin's brutal, corrupt and authoritarian rule. Ukraine, on the other hand, has seen collective national will manifest in all sorts of places since the start of the invasion. Nichols points out that another way to analyze national will in a military campaign is through the geographic lens of deep, close and rear operations. In the most straightforward sense, deep operations consist of things like long-range strikes and precise raids behind enemy lines to disrupt key assets. Close operations are generally thought of as brutal, close quarters combat necessary to take territory, and rear operations consist of non-combat support elements like headquarters, supply lines and logistics bases. Like other elements in military doctrine, these three areas are not exact guidelines for warfighting, but instead a lens or loose conceptual framework that helps everyone from commanders to analysts assess issues, opportunities and the larger operational environment of a conflict. The biggest challenge for anyone engaged in a military campaign is to align the various parts and sections of a country to serve the broader goal of warfare. This means that everybody from foot soldiers and drone operators to civilians watching their TV screens back home must be on board with the conflict. In this sense, Nichols is very right to point out that deep, close and rear operations can be understood as far more than just physical, geographic elements. Rather, they entail what he calls the architecture needed for the battle in the mind the area where wars are really won or lost. What does this mean? For one thing, modern conflicts, especially long ones, are rarely won just through overwhelming firepower or number of troops. Instead, they require the combination of many disparate elements from across society to bolster the morale of one nation and destroy another's will to fight. The first takeaway, while obvious, is one Putin seems to have forgotten. A military strategy lacking in national or international support is far, far less likely to succeed. As Nichols argues, in this broader understanding, deep operations are often psychological, aiming to intimidate and unsettle the enemy with a range of tools. For instance, General Karela Badanov, the head of Ukraine's military intelligence, recently posted a tweet where he spent 30 seconds staring at the camera without saying a word. This Plans of Silence video showed a stoic, self-confidence meant to terrify any Russian conscript who watched it, an ominous you're not ready for what's coming. Other psychological deep operations are aimed at allies around the world, intended to drum up external support and convey the message that we're on the same team. With Ukraine, we see this every time President Zelensky or Defense Minister Alexei Reznikov have traveled abroad to show that unlike Putin's Russia, their country is part of the rules-based international order. We saw this strategy in full swing earlier in July, during the annual NATO summit in Vilnius, Lithuania. As the event kicked off, the city's walls were full of blue and yellow posters, Ukrainian flags hung on every street, and many locals told stories about their own memories of Russian imperialism. Zelensky appeared to a screaming crowd of thousands calling for Ukraine's NATO accession and increased support in the years ahead. 
His appearance was a strong signal that Ukraine is on NATO's team and that both share a common vision of the future. And this type of deep operation seems to be highly effective. Karolina Vitonyene, a Vilnius local who watched alongside friends and her daughter, told reporters that it was very emotional. We understand that they, the Ukrainians, are fighting for our freedom as well. Each of us remembers what it's like to live under occupation or knows the stories from their families. It is this sort of common cause that has helped with Zelensky's massive international support. The 37-year-old recalled her childhood nightmares that a Russian tank would roll over her home, stating that she wanted her daughter to grow up in a world where that would not be possible. For a war effort to succeed in our modern, hyper-connected world, this type of support is critical. And to maintain it, the leaders of a military campaign must be constantly engaged in outreach to their coalition of international supporters. Doing so gives Ukraine economic leverage over Russia, keeps vital military supplies flowing into the country, and ensures that the Ukrainian cause remains seen as morally righteous and worthy of support by key allies. Psychological rear operations are also critical for a successful military campaign. They offer hope to a nation's own citizens, aiming to keep morale high and a national spirit intact, even while they remain under constant threat. Ukraine's leaders have also engaged heavily in this sort of rear operation, using everything from Twitter to in-person visits to the front lines to Zelensky's appearance at the Kyiv Book Fair. Some of the most potent of these efforts resulted in words which inspired millions of Ukrainians to fight tooth and nail for their country. Remember the video of Ukraine's cabinet remaining in Kyiv just after the invasion began, or the now-famous statement, I need ammunition, not a ride. This sort of determination from a nation's leaders can have an enormous impact on citizens' willingness to fight and possibly die for a cause. It's not just words during moments of crisis either. Some psychological rear operations are effective because they take place during ordinary moments worth defending. Zelensky attending a book fair might seem like a weird thing for a wartime president to do, but it makes perfect sense through his lens. Natalia Gomenyuk, the book fair's events curator, asked one reporter, what is democracy? How do we experience freedom? What do we mean by inclusivity or the unity of the country? And are these values really worth fighting and dying for? The war made these questions real instead of abstract, and Zelensky's presence at such an ordinary event signaled to his audience that he does not take them for granted. This can be an incredibly powerful tool during wartime, keeping the civilian population on board with military operations, even when there is no end in sight. By showing that normal life is something worth fighting and putting your life on the line for, Ukrainian officials offer both a rallying cry and a goal for post-conflict existence. Even close operations, usually thought of as only brutal frontline combat, have a psychological dimension. Soldiers need to be inspired both before and during their deployments, especially since life in the trenches is often miserable and terrifying. In Ukraine, the military has set up multiple organizations to deal with this problem. One, the Center for Moral and Psychological Support, helps mentally prepare soldiers for the dangers and stresses of forward deployment. The head of the center, Captain Andrei Karachevsky, had PTSD himself and has explained that it's an intervention prior to combat. We are part of the weaponry. We give them skills to deal with combat. How a soldier is to understand the range of emotions from anger to grief to confusion and many more that he may feel. How a soldier is to manage what he is feeling both there and afterwards. The other goal of such centers is to prevent as many mental health crises as possible among active and returning soldiers, by promoting inclusive and emotionally aware leadership among battlefield commanders. The hope is that doing so will prevent Ukraine's overstretched armed forces from breaking down. It's also a way to change stigmas around mental health by making it easier and more acceptable for people to seek out psychological help. Much like inspiring speeches or visits to the book fair, this type of operation is just another way Ukraine's leaders are working to keep their entire nation on board with a war that doesn't look to be stopping anytime soon. And like the others, it shows us a fundamental truth about conflicts. Often the victor is whichever side can best maintain and channel a sense of collective purpose and unity of action. And as important as the psychological elements of a military campaign can be, the underlying moral structure of a military campaign can be just as critical. These values form a thread, which can either bind a society together or allow it to fray under the stresses of conflict. The moral values supporting Ukraine's campaign include self-determination, freedom from violence, and democracy, a powerful combination for supporters both at home and around the world. In Putin's Russia, on the other hand, the thread is one of grievance, fear, self-interest, and domination. 
Unlike in Ukraine, these are not the sort of values that make for a unified and successful campaign. Instead, they are the type of ideas that erode a nation's moral and psychological foundations. Put another way, the climate of Putin's Russia makes it pretty clear to conscripts and generals alike that their lives and opinions are meaningless. Basically, they're not the sort of ideals that could inspire some poor conscript on the front lines that what he is doing really matters at all. These ideas are part of what is sometimes called soft power, the ability to shape the preferences of others through appeal and attraction rather than force. Ukraine's war effort has created huge amounts of its own soft power, as supporters rally online, post memes, crowdfund operations, and take to the streets. Meanwhile, the Russian invasion has had very little soft power from the start, with most of the world rejecting Putin's imperialist vision of the world. Political scientist Joseph Nye, who coined the term, described it as the simple fact that the best propaganda is not propaganda, and in the internet age, credibility is the scarcest resource. People around the world saw Putin's insane speeches and Russia's invasion begin on TV, computer and phone screens, and that's what has given Ukraine an edge in support for more than a year. This is yet another part of national will, as soft power influences whether a nation stands alone or with a coalition, and whether it can outlast its enemies. If soldiers on the battlefield feel that there are allies big and small behind them, there is also likely to be better morale and performance in the field. Putin does not have this type of soft power appeal, but knows that he can't continue to rule totally alone. Because of this, every time he has tried to engage in psychological deep, close and rear operations, the results appear forced and unnatural. Years and years of Putin's brutal rule have left modern Russia as a place of staggering corruption and oppression, where daily life for millions is defined by fear and helplessness at the feet of a thankless government. It's very hard to build an effective society and military off of this model, especially when enough people see through the illusion created by those in power. This disconnect is obvious when we see Putin, who meets his advisors deep inside one of his personal fortresses and across the length of a huge table, suddenly appearing in Dagestan to greet crowds of seemingly adoring fans. Rather than showing unity, like Zelensky in Vilnius or at the book fair, Putin's actions come off as callous and fake. Why? because anyone not neck deep in Russian propaganda can see his obvious disregard and contempt for the lives of ordinary citizens. The illusion holds only through his iron fist, and willingness to kill, torture, imprison, or exile anyone who might be a threat. And nothing is worse for real national will than a system glued together only by terror. When it fails, we start to see the cracks in a tyrant's rule. Christopher Bort, a scholar with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, has written a lot about this idea. In his view, one of the most enduring features of the Russian government is a willingness by its leaders to sacrifice ordinary people's lives for their personal goals. The ruler's needs have always come first, and Putin is just the latest in a long line of self-serving men in power. For instance, then-US General Eisenhower was apparently in disbelief when Soviet Marshal Georgi Zhukov told him the standard method for clearing minefields during the Second World War was to send unknowing infantry troops across them as if the mines were not there. Putin's presidency and strategy in Ukraine show a similar lack of concern for human life. Bort points out the clear parallel that prior to Russia's invasion, for instance, the Kremlin's chain of command appears not to have told Russian soldiers that they were about to enter Ukraine to fight a real war. Afterward, the same chain of command neglected to claim those soldiers' bodies because acknowledging their deaths might embarrass the Kremlin. That probably doesn't surprise you by this point, which says something about how predictably horrible Putin's war strategy has become. And while we haven't yet seen the dam of Putin's support break yet, a broader analysis of the conflict shows that things can't last forever. Considering deep, close and rear operations in the way Nichols lays out gives us a picture of a Russia failing badly in many areas, not just on the battlefield. No country can fight forever if its national will for a conflict is exhausted. A lesson the West has learned the hard way. Nichols offers a reminder that during the post-9-11 war on terror, the United Kingdom outsourced many of its military operations in the Middle East to its defense ministry and contractors, with a lack of interest by the central government or public. The same can be said about the United States, which relied heavily on superior military power and outsourced much of the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq to private contractors. Eventually, conflict fatigue, loss of life and money 
and the persistent harsh reality on the ground has led to both wars widely being considered as failures. Most recently, this led to the US military pullout from Afghanistan and Taliban re-takeover in 2020, capping two decades of unachieved national objectives. Things have already gone far worse for Putin in Ukraine than they did for the West in Iraq or Afghanistan, but he does not seem to have learned his lesson. And because of his autocratic rule, he also can't seem to get that when a country's psychological operations on the battlefield, the hearts and minds of citizens, and towards the international community are unified, it makes for a tough opponent. Ukraine has pulled this off, and achieved a level of unity by its military commanders, political leaders, and civil society that Putin never has and will never have. Ukraine is fighting this war with a common purpose, while most Russians are fighting it out of fear and for the whims of a powerful man. The good news is that a country like that can never win, not really. War is not just fought on the battlefield but also in the minds of soldiers and civilians, the halls of diplomatic summits, and the press of a book fair. The way countries win wars is by bringing the efforts of an entire society into alignment and preserving national will longer than the enemy. Putin can't do that. Instead, he largely sits alone in his fortress, trusting nobody and caring for nobody, unable to really bring most Russians or countries around the world onto his side. It's the inevitable crack in his armor, and that's why Russia's military can't outlast Ukraine's. Finally, it's also the reason why we shouldn't judge the success of Ukraine's ongoing counteroffensive yet. So far, it has been far more about determining Russia's logistical and defense capabilities, harming enemy morale, and shoring up Ukraine's own geopolitical support from crucial allies. While there has been some increase in direct combat, it's nothing like we saw during the last fall counteroffensive. Basically, it looks like Zelensky and his top officials are playing a broader game this time around, potentially hoping to change the balance of power. So we shouldn't count Ukraine out now or anytime soon, especially since its unified national will is a clear long-term advantage. Whether this war lasts another year, two or more, Putin's Russia is not in a place that can hold on forever. But what do you think? Is Nichols right about how important national will is in today's conflicts? And will it let Ukraine outlast Russia? Let us know what you think in the comments below, and don't forget to subscribe for more military content and analysis.